Rufkan finally was down and uh, we had a pretty good time at uh, Rufkan finally was there for the same day. I am really glad that he's back here in Bangalore and I hope there's more reasons for you to come back to Bangalore. And uh, I think just by way of brief introduction, uh, Rufkan has worked at uh, various places including Netflix, HashiCorp, uh, has been an open source contributor, continues to contribute. And uh, I would sort of guess that he's also very passionate about writing about his work and so I suppose if you look online you might find papers and uh, there's a book in the pipeline which maybe we'll talk about at some point. Yep. Um, and uh, I think what he's here today is to talk about uh, uh, this uh, paper that's going to get published and uh, I think over to you Vikram, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Alright, let's do this. Um, so this is, I've never done this talk before and uh, uh, I hope like it all works out. Um, so uh, usually I do speaker notes and prepare myself uh, and uh, think what I'm going to speak ahead of time, but uh, not this time. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so we're going to be talking about cluster schedulers today and especially like what are the patterns for building cluster schedulers, right? What are the patterns that, that are important for cluster scheduler developers and for operators when they are evaluating a cluster scheduler, right? Uh, the last one or two years, actually more than that, like there has been a lot of movement in the cluster scheduling work. Uh, I remember like, you, uh, like three years back when I was doing cluster schedulers at Netflix or maybe four years now. I, when I was doing cluster schedulers uh, for Netflix, Kubernetes just came out, right? And uh, there was, uh, Mesos was like the big dog in the, in the, in the industry. Uh, Twitter was using Mesos for a long time. Uh, and even before Twitter, like uh, those engineers like who wrote Mesos, like they were at Google uh, doing Borg. And, uh, and there has been a lot of movement in the last uh, few years on cluster schedulers in general. And uh, like today the conversation is around, okay, like w which, cluster, which cluster scheduler should I be using? It's not so much like, okay, should I use a cluster scheduler or not? I think we are past that phase, right? Today the con conversation is around, should I use Nomad or should I use uh, uh, Kubernetes or should I use Mesos or should I even use Docker Swarm? Um, and uh, a lot of those conversations that I see happen are around, oh, I use this and this has worked for me and so on and this is what someone else uses and we are in production on this many nodes. But the conversation uh, that I, 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 ho I feel like we should be having is, uh, how does cluster schedulers make your life easy as an operations person or as, uh, or as an operator or like as a, as a service owner. If you're running a service, like how does cluster schedulers make your life easy? How does it, what does it bring onto the table, right? So I want to talk about the first principles of like the problems that you're going to face or problem that anyone is going to face when writing a new cluster scheduler or when uh, running a new cluster scheduler in an organization. Um, and, uh, and through that, we are going to be talking about the patterns that, that cluster schedulers should incorporate to, uh, to uh, make you sleep through the night. Uh, so the software delivery pipeline, um, it, go ahead. Highly available cluster schedulers. Yeah, 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 and also like, uh, by, and by by that it also applies to services. What it means is that if if you're running something on a cluster scheduler, and if the cluster scheduler is itself not available, there will be like other problems in your in your infrastructure where like the where your service might go down because your cluster scheduler is not uh, is not uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing. And I'll touch on that later, like why that matters. Uh, so the typical software delivery pipeline in the last decade looked like this, right? You take code from SCM and then you push it to through your build infrastructure and then like you create uh, some artifacts and so on and then you ha use some kind of deployment automation tool like Chef or M Collective or Puppet and then, and, and then deploy them in, on your infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and, and the deployment auto orchestration like has been like the heart of like the DevOps movement. Whenever you talk to like anyone like who does DevOps or anyone or any organization who is adopting uh, uh, DevOps practices, like you would hear that, oh, we are uh, using code to deploy our software. We are not manually deploying anything. So it, the, the conversation was always about a configuration management, right? What runs on a server and like how do you deploy software, right? Like that was the biggest problem, right? In the last decade, because people were trying to find it hard to release software 
and like most of the tools are, was around okay how do I make a release how do I make sure like the, the, the release that I am making is consistently getting deployed and putting into production but deployment in my deployment orchestration and deployment in general um, I feel like are only like 10% of the life of a software you have deployed fine but then what happens after that um, those prob the answers to those problems were not really answered by uh, tools like chef or puppet or m collective and so on right like service management right was left to um, for example to supervisors like if a service crashed if a process crashed you would have something like um, init d or like system d or something like that or pick your favorite supervisor to like restart your service and so on or like it didn't even have runtime hooks with the application right if your application is performing poorly there was no deployment automation tool like which was going to like scale you up so like obviously like on public cloud uh, there were like other things like auto scaling groups and so on which had hooks with the runtime via metrics so the application then like emitted metrics and then like other things came into the picture and then did stuff right um, and also the most important thing was that it had a static view of your cluster and your data center right someone somewhere said that you had this x number of machines and now you would always deploy onto those x number of machines that means like it always had the idea of like a subset of machines which would never change now performance or like your traffic characteristics changes over time right and then like it would basically be up to like a human being to understand like how things are changing how the the application is changing and then translate that to like your cluster topology right and also when things failed right like if you had an EBS failure or you had like a machine go down and so on or like a disk failure right like then it was then like what happens right your application crashes or whatever and then your supervisor tries to bring it up again and then it again crashes ultimately those kind of resolutions those kind of remediation actions was left to people right human beings and what happens with that is that doesn't scale the reason why it doesn't scale is that if you have one service it scales well you can have five people doing on-call rotation and fix those problems and always have a pager attached to them right now as your organization grows and as you're doing things like microservices and so on right like the number of services is going to grow like over time and and the root problem of like having people doing pagers is that you can hire at the rate at which your business grows because the amount of people amount of talent you have in the market is going to be not sufficient to to like what you would need to continue that practice of like people solving the the, the people doing the remediation actions or people running the remediation actions and that's where the dynamic cluster scheduling comes into the picture right with with the dynamic cluster scheduler um, what happens is you sort of want software to do the work that people were doing right you you want your cluster scheduler to be in charge of all the hardware you have you want your cluster scheduler to understand the services that that you have in your that you need to run in your data center you you want your cluster scheduler to take care of like simpler problems like okay there is a node um, failing I need to move the service somewhere else and right? those kind of things which can be automated right you want um, like like someone like a supervisor like a data center supervisor to do and that's where cluster schedulers come into the picture right and as I was saying service management auto, like service management needs um, needs to understand like the the topology of the of the cluster in a, in a more dynamic manner right that's the crux of the problem right like instead of like static statically um, um, giving feedback to people um, you want like software to understand the state of the cluster and do those remediation actions um, so what are the things that cluster scheduler should provide right cluster scheduler should provide the the, the self-healing capabilities right like if you want five shards of your application to be running it needs to make sure that five shards are running um, it needs to provide apis to operators um, like for example if a machine is failing or like you don't want to run machine uh, services in USC 1A or like a particular zone 
because you know there are some problems in that zone. You need the cluster scheduler to give you API so that you can, you can get out of that zone. You can not schedule any more services on that zone. This is, this is, this is like very important to remember and perhaps I should have had a slide about this is people think about cluster schedulers providing an API to service owners. The whole, like the whole work around or the PR around Docker and Kubernetes has been around making developers faster. That's half of the story. The other half of the story, I believe, is like making operators operate the machines that you have, right? Say for example, you are hard bleed or like some, like one or like the thing that is going on right now, the KPTI, uh, the, 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 the KPTI problem that is happening in Linux right now. Say you have like unpatched servers and patched servers. Your service owners doesn't care. They want like X number of shards of their application running, right? But it's up to like the reliability people. It's up to the security people to make sure no services are running on unpatched machines, right? So then your cluster scheduler needs to provide APIs to your operators, to your, to your reliability engineers, right? Um, uh, to drain nodes or to drain clusters and to make sure services are only running on patched machines and so on. The other thing is it needs to, uh, go ahead. The other thing is, the, the other thing is uh, quality of service guarantees. Um, in, in, I, I'm going to talk about multi-tenancy in a little bit, but if you're in a multi-tenant world, right, cluster scheduler needs to provide the quality of service guarantees where like and service doesn't, uh, should use like the amount of resources that it is supposed to be using. Um, and this is kind of interesting, right? Like this, all this like, this whole movement around all this stuff started with Docker. We actually like invented things like from the bottom up rather than from going from the top, right? So if, if for example, if you're using like Kubernetes or like Nomad or anything like that, you would probably be using like some tool like Docker or LXC or something to, to provide um, quality of service guarantees. In that case, like the cluster scheduler has to understand when an application is violating the quality of service that has been, uh, that, that it should, um, or the resources that it has, it is supposed to be consuming when it consumes more or, you know, when it exceeds the quota. So cluster schedulers needs to be aware of the underlying resources and so on. And the last part is that cluster schedulers need to provide APIs to like higher level services like DCOS or Cloud Foundry. Right, cluster schedulers are fairly low level. Your application developers probably need like a higher level API so that which can understand the concept of a service and the concept of things like racks and so on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Oh, just, just saying. If you have a question, let's talk about that. So but if you have a comment, let's talk, no, do this after the talk. Uh, I, I, the question is, what proportion of your applications have the structure that enables you to use uh, these uh, Sure. So I, I think I think that's an I think that's an orthogonal question altogether, right? Like, if you want to run a right run a database, right? Like. If you want to run like whatever, right? Like going to your example, right? You are, you are saying that because, you know, like people did not understand state very well and they had, they had state everywhere and now people are doing like stateless and stateful services, you can run cluster schedulers. I think, I, I, I don't think like I would agree with that. I think, I think if you want to run stateful services on a, on a scheduler, you can run stateful services on a scheduler provided you have a scheduler which understands state. Provided you have schedulers which understand um, the concept of a persistent volume, provided the scheduler understands that the life cycle of a process and the life cycle of, a, of, of the persistent volume are decoupled with each other. 
the fact that we struggle to run stateful services on cluster schedulers today is because the cluster schedulers were not designed for them, right? And 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 like and as you pointed out, cluster schedulers have existed for the last 40 years, but they have existed in the HPC world, right? In the high performance computing world, there was SunGrid engine and so on. Um, I think I think what catapulted the use of cluster scheduler is that the kind of things that Yahoo or Google was doing uh, in the last uh, two decades, more people are trying to do that. And for doing to do that with like like as I was saying, like with with like if you want to not linearly scale as your business grows and as your infrastructure grows with the number of people you have, you have to use something like cluster schedulers. I think the architecture of like the services that we run, right, has for sure, like to your point, has like pushed us towards using cluster schedulers. But I would not 100% agree that it's only because people are doing state and stateful services differently today. Like it's more cluster schedulers are more, uh, what, do you, what do you call, uh, more approachable. Right, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, uh, let's talk about it more after afterwards. So, so, so to 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 provide us all these things that we need from cluster schedulers um, or dynamic service management systems, we have cluster schedulers today, right? Mesos, Kubernetes, Nomad, these are all good. If if I didn't include like the logo of your favorite cluster scheduler. That's only because the slide, I had uh, limitations of how the slide, uh, need, how big the slide can be. But insert your favorite scheduler here. But schedulers are not the silver bullet, right, that we want them to be, right? Um, like schedulers fail all the time. I have been on call when I was at Netflix for one and a half year running the scheduler that I wrote. I used to get paged like every other day, right? Because something or the other would fail, right? And it's not like, you know, we would fail for the same reason tomorrow. We would fix the reason why we failed today and there would be like some other problem crop up in our infrastructure which would cause failures. So, so what, what, is, what remains constant though is like we had to plan for failures. We had to assume that our scheduler is going to fail, right? Say for example, to give you an example, like to, to the point that, uh, that uh, you raised earlier was uh, when you talk about highly available scheduler, are you talking about why do you, like, are you actually talking about the availability of the schedulers or the availability of the service? Uh, I would say that they are related. Say, for example, at 7 p.m., you have a video on demand uh, application uh, service. Um, and uh, at 7 p.m. is like your peak time, right? People come from uh, work and they want to watch Black Mirror or so whatever. And uh, you can't have your service go down, right? Now, let me... Let me throw an example of like a hypothetical failure that, we, and actually like we actually uh, saw, saw it happen. Say for example, your cluster scheduler depends on a data store like Zookeeper, right? And, uh, and uh, for some reason, the Zookeeper isn't working anymore. And now your cluster scheduler has lost the state of like your cluster. And at 7 p.m. when you have peak traffic, you want to auto scale. You want to have more API servers because you are seeing like more, uh, you know, uh, more API requests for starting new videos. And uh, what happens when, uh, and also let's say that your API servers are using something like Tomcat, which is a threaded server. So now those, now since you can't auto scale because your clusters are, your, auto, your uh, cluster scheduler is not using, uh, so not working, so some, uh, all of a sudden you will see like n more number of users trying to hit the same fixed number of Tomcat API servers that you had. And now, most of the threads are going to be busy uh, uh, doing existing requests. And so you will see, um, um, so you will see like high CPU usage and once you see high CPU usage, all, all your API servers are going to be unresponsive and now you have a failure. So what started as a failure in your cluster scheduler now cascaded into your API. And once you have cascaded, once that failure has cascaded into API, like, you know, your service is down pretty much, right? So I think like availability of cluster scheduler or availability of any service that you depend, that another service depends on, like is the key. Like understanding the relationship is, is the key. So I'm going to talk about failures on cluster schedulers and their remediation strategies at like three level. Uh, the first is like the node levels, like where we are going to talk about the failures that happen at the machine level, at a node level. 
and second, uh, uh, failures that happen at the cluster level, and third, failures that happen at the control plane, at the schedulers itself. Um, so node level failures, right? Uh, capacity planning. So today, like when you are running, today when you are running a cluster scheduler like Kubernetes um, or like Mesos or whatever, you are doing, uh, you are not only just running your applications in a container, but you are probably running like some kind of logging agent or you're running some kind of sidecar and so on. Most people, they obviously like they put a quota and limitation of resource usages on their containers, but they often don't un realize that there are some system services as well. Right, the system services has to be treated the same way the applications are being treated. They have to be put under C groups. They have to be put under namespaces and so on, so that they don't exceed their resource usage. Because once they exceed their resource usage, since the scheduler doesn't control them or the scheduler is not imposing like um, um, resource constraints on them, they will impact the quality of service of the services running, the actual services running. Right? So it's very important to measure the, quality, the, the overhead of something like a sidecar or like a logging agent or even like your Docker daemon. Right? Um, if you're using uh, file systems like ZFS, understand like how the file system cache works. Right? Uh, the reason why this is important is today like in C groups V1, uh, the, the, IO, the, the mechanism for con controlling IOPS of system read and write is very much broken. So two, two, uh, two different containers can run on the same machine and there are very uh, fairly bad ways of like how you can restrict the IOPS. So what it means is that if you for example have a 2 GB uh, limited the, the cache, uh, the file system cache to 2 GB and uh, one container is doing a lot of IO, it's going to exhaust all, the, all, the, all your uh, ZFS cache, the R cache. Um, so understand like what is, how, how your file system caching works and so on. I, I had an outage back in the day where I didn't limit the, uh, the, the ZFS arc size. And uh, one fine day I saw like applications are not able to malloc anymore. And uh, when I did, uh, when I saw what's happening, I saw like uh, ZFS was using like half the memory of all the machine. Uh, even though like it was supposed to not use more than like say one or two gigs. That's because I didn't put a constraint there, right? The last is like put garbage collection properties uh, or logic of things like log rotation and things like that, which understand the, uh, the, what are the units of the underlying resources. You doing log rotation after seven days doesn't mean anything if like the disk is of fixed size. So do log rotation and things like that of say like of the same unit as the underlying resources because seven days of log doesn't say much, right? Your unit at the disk layer is like inter you're measuring in terms of bytes, number of bytes and not days, right? Oops, um killer. The um killer in Linux is fairly complex, and it's 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 you know very few people understand how the um killer works. Uh, over over the time of a process, like the kernel keeps a score, like which is called the um score, and whenever like uh, the kernel is under stress, like it starts randomly killing processes, right? Uh, so if we, if for example you have a sidecar which is using all the all the memory, and because of that there is like an um, um uh, situation the kernel might ki kill like a process which did not cause that. So what I have seen and what we have done in most of our cluster schedulers is we make sure the, we can kill process in the user space. Because when we kill process in the user space using OOM um notifications and so on, um, we have a control and we, we have a deterministic way of, of knowing like which process we have to kill rather than the kernel deciding like we can, the cluster scheduler agent can decide that. This is, this is, um, this I think like is a key, like if you're doing a lot of packing or like if you have a lot of density on a single machine. Um, and, and I think the last thing that I wrote here is that, um, you know, like of course put everything under a C group, right, a memory C group. Um, this is not uh, my favorite topic and I think this is, a, this is a topic that people can't do much, is that software like Docker are, not, are traditionally bad, are like traditionally unreliable. Right, like if you go to like Docker's website, because of the pace at which like the soft, the the project moves, like they add a lot of regressions as well. Uh, like I think like six or seven months uh, back, uh, you know, I had an outage where um, uh, Docker was leaking the AUFS uh, uh, layers and so on. And uh, you know, like who would plan for that, right? Like you don't you don't plan for things like that um, unless like that outage happens. And so. Um, 
we figured out that like ra ra like we have to plan for like a failures of like the docker daemon itself so it's very important to to understand like how the docker daemon is doing by defining metrics like how much cpu it is using how much disk it is using how much disk it is using at the number of actual containers which is running and when something goes south the remediation actions could simply be the scheduler drains that node or like drains that pool of node with a, that version of docker right and so on um and optimize for like and most importantly like optimize for like cluster level efficiency while at the node like we talk about um the number of cpu cores which are available the number of ram which is available but people pe amount of memory which is available people often forget that in at especially in public cloud that a lot of resources are bound by the network io because like things like block storage and so on like are actually like on the network right or like if you have if maybe like your network card can uh, fing you fingerprint the network card and you see that it's like a 100 gig network right like a network card but the actual link layer might only be like 10 gb or like even less like 5 gb right so like expose all the of the all the properties of the network up to the scheduler a schedulable resource right so even if you have like cpu cores which are not um, uh, being used don't oversubscribe the machine right don't oversubscribe this machine in such a way that the network is saturated um so that like overall um your your application performs well at the cluster level um as i was saying um uh, schedulers provide qos which is nice uh, when you uh, when you hear about it or in paper uh, when when people make promises that okay i'm going to let you do um like you know have 50 megahertz of like cpu cores but that's not true what happens is multi tenancy in linux is like horribly broken today uh, have you anyone programmed on using simd instructions like or avx512 instructions on intel so these are like vector instructions right so what happens with vector instructions is like they need a lot of power right and say you are running like non vector instructions which need less power the intel what intel would do is it will reduce the base frequency so that the simd instructions or the vector instructions don't consume as much power as like say for example like if your peak peak uh, cpu's uh, performance is like say 3 gigahertz like if you run vector instructions like you will see like it drop down to like 2 gigahertz or something right so say for example you are running like an open ssl or like a heavy crypto library right open ssl or chacha or something like that which uses vector instructions and then you are running like non vector instructions like normal stuff right like i don't know like whatever like something which takes json and writes to the database and so on which is like most of the workload today right so now you will see all of a sudden like your normal workload is suffering because like something else is using open ssl which is using vector instructions so on linux unfortunately um uh, uh, multi tenancy is not a solved problem right um so what you do in that situation is you isolate workloads to like a clusters right you tell your scheduler tag your nodes or tag your clusters to say that run applications which are more io sensitive in this cluster run applications which are more which are doing vector instructions on other um, other clusters and so on that's like one way of solving it right let's go to cluster level failures um most often cluster level failures happen because of bad software period right the software doesn't only mean like application software it also means configuration go to like the outages of like amazon google or any cloud provider the last few outages you will see or most of the outages you will see is because of bad configuration right it's because like someone has pushed a bad configuration and now the the whole thing is getting impact, impacted so never ever release software to the entire population or to all the nodes always do rolling upgrades see like how the metrics are and make sure like there is a feedback control loop loop and like an um, the scheduler or like the the deployment system understand the metrics that the scheduler is providing if for example after doing a new push the the uh, scheduler sees a lot of crash schedulers should like stop deploying right and so on um we did something similar in in nomad recently where a nomad uses the state uh, from console and like fig figures out like whether um, like a cluster is healthy or not 
uh, system software failure, um, as I was saying, like uh, deeply scrutinize like the system software that are running on a machine. And if, uh, for example, uh, it doesn't work well, uh, anything doesn't work well, like just roll back to like an older version. So the, 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 the most effective way I have done this in the past is by having like really long staging period, right? Like run and r try to run like a very stable version. If you have to like update the version, make sure like it's actually um, running in production on a very smaller percentage of, of the node for quite some time, see the metrics, compare the metrics, and then like make sure like it gets deployed. Uh, for security vulnerabilities, you must be thinking like, how can I run an older version of the software? I mean, most people like who are uh, responsible, uh, responsible software engineers, if they have a security vulnerability in their code, like they would do like a, some backward, uh, they would pa backport the, the, those patches into like an older version as well. Um, so this, the, the staging time of systems of software should be like much larger than uh, say um, something like an application. Um, depletion of global resources basically means if you are re relying on something like AWS to bring machines and so on, if you have a cluster level failure and like say for example your application is performing less or like uh, performing badly or like say like you are having um, certain problems on a on like on a on certain Amazon uh, machines and so on. Um, the remediation step could be the cluster scheduler or the orchestration system brings back like more more nodes in other zones or in other places. But remember that there are global resource global limits. Like for example, the number of API calls you can make, right? Or the number of nodes you can even bring up like in a given time frame. By bringing by being very aggressive about remediation you could deplete those global resources and even dig yourself in like a, in a bigger hole, right? Um, control flame plane failures, I think this is the, the, the harder, this is the hardest part of like the, 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 the entire uh, story. That's because it needs a lot of theoretical knowledge, right? A, a lot of knowledge about distributed systems. What I mean by control state, a cluster, um, control plane failures in general is what happens when there is a failure in the scheduler itself, right? And uh, to understand like failures or to debug or to plan for failures in schedulers, in the control plane of the schedulers, right? You have to understand like what is the underlying data source it is using, right? Or what is the scheduling mechanism, for example? Like let's, let's take some example, right? Say for example, your cluster scheduler uses Zookeeper, right? In the case of Mesos or in the case of of, of Kubernetes is uses etcd and it's same in Nomad like we use something called Raft right which which under the hood etcd is also using. All these things are highly consistent right like strongly consistent rather right strongly consistent systems because the reason why they are strongly consistent is because the cluster scheduler wants a view of the of the cluster topology so that like it doesn't oversubscribe without knowing. It can oversubscribe it, it if it decides that it can oversubscribe but but it doesn't want to oversubscribe just because it is unaware of the cluster state, right? Um, again, like uh, to, to, to our earlier conversation about persistent volumes, right? For example, if you're doing persistent volumes and if, you, and if it's a schedulable resource, if you don't use a strongly consistent system, you might be asking or you might allow two different process to use the same, consistent, same persistent volumes, right? So if you use, so if you use something like an AP database, right? Like things, things won't work well, right? So most cluster schedulers uses a, 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 a CP data store, but in general, we want our cluster schedulers to be highly available. So that, that's the tension, right? From an operator perspective, the operator never wants the cluster scheduler to go down. Even if some parts of the cluster scheduler goes down, the operator would want as much it can have from the cluster scheduler. So there is like a tension there, right? So what it means is that the schedulers, we need to build them in such a way that they can reconcile from data loss, right? What it means, right? For example, you lose Zookeeper or you lose, I don't know, like etcd or whatever, right? Like in your favorite scheduler. Can your scheduler build a state from the, from the running agents that are there in the cluster? In, Mo, in Mesos, it's, it's possible in part. Mesos has something called a task registry where like the framework can send a message 
and like the scheduler and the agents, the Mesos agents responds back with like the tasks which are running. But then there is no upper limit of like when the cluster is going to reconcile, right? So, so in Nomad, we took a different approach, right? In Nomad, we said that if you lose all the scheduler nodes, like no, like there is no, like there is no way of you can like get back to like a healthy state without rerunning all the job files again, right? So resubmit all your jobs, your cluster state will, uh, state will reconcile. Maybe in the future we'll do like things like backups and all that, but this is a fairly complex topic, right? Reconciling state from failed data um, from running nodes is like a fairly complex topic. Um, and, uh, and this is something like I think operators needs to plan for um, and uh, needs to prepare for basically. The other thing is like the scheduler mechanism itself. Say for example, you have you have a you um, you have you have a, uh, a time limit that I need to be scaling up my services within like say 20 minutes or like 10 minutes at peak. At peak, when like you know like traffic hits the roof, I want to get like things as fast as possible. You also have to understand like how is the scheduler working? Is it event driven or is it like level triggered? Level trigger scheduling basically means the scheduler is running in a loop and then it's looking for the tasks which are not running, right? It's basically comparing the goal state and the current state and then it's basically reconciling the cluster state. So what it means is that there is some basic um, like minimum time limit for the scheduler to take an action, right? So you might, if you want to dispatch a job right now, you might have to wait till like your scheduler runs again and like it might have things like head of line blocking, right? He might have thrown um, like a job, bad job, which has 10,000 uh, units of work. Whereas my stuff is more like important. It's like five nodes, five shards of an application. But if the scheduler is working on all the things together, it might have head of line blocking, where the scheduler might be spending CPU cycles in scheduling the batch workload and not really working on like the, the um, uh, what is it, um, the, the service workload. So in that case, like event-driven schedulers perform much better because in event-driven schedulers, the scheduler is invoked the moment like a new event happens. That event could be like a node going down or someone submitting a job and so on. Um, we did event-driven scheduling in Nomad. Um, if you want to learn more about event-driven uh, scheduling, the Omega paper is good. Uh, there is another paper called the Pharmament paper, which is uh, written by Malte who did the Omega too. Uh, he, he, he writes like some good stuff about uh, how do you do event driven scheduling. Uh, Mesos is also sort of event driven scheduling. I am saying sort of because what happens is most scheduler, most schedulers I know or some schedulers I should say, they, they wait till a bunch of events, um, till a bunch of events show, shows up and then, then they decide like, uh, like how, uh, then they decide like scheduling, uh, how they are going to schedule or take actions based on those events. Second, second thing is like implement quotas, right? Uh, bad days are going to happen. Amazon is going to have outage. Your data center is going to have outage. There might be power failures and so on. Uh, you are going to have resource crunch for sure, right? Like you are going to have at some stage, you're going to have resource crunches. When you have resource crunches and when people are contenting for resources, quotas are what saves the day. With quotas, you can make sure like the business critical services are running and the, and the services like map reduce and so on, which can happen much later are like backlogged, right? Um, and in some cases, quotas are also useful for the quality of services uh, guarantee on the local agent because based on that, the, the agents which is actually running the containers can determine like what to prefer when there is a, um, there are problems on the local node itself. So in the end, I want you to take home this message where plan to reboot your data center plan whatever, whichever, no matter which, which uh, scheduler you're using, which deployment automation you're using, uh, prepare for failure of that software itself and be ready to know like how the organization behaves when the cluster scheduler fails. If your cluster scheduler fails when you don't have to scale out or when there is a period when you don't need to deploy anything or your hardware is not failing, then no one knows what has happened right behind the scenes. But if your cluster scheduler has failed at the same time when your hardware has failed or like during your peak time, that's when like you need to understand how the organization is behaving, who is calling whom, who, like what kind of commotion it is happening. At like a very large scale, 
like we see very interesting thing happen happening when like schedulers fail. Like a lot of people ask the same questions. So instead of like working on solving the problem that has happened on the cluster scheduler, like we are often like talking to our service owners and telling them, informing them what is happening. So like make sure the incident management workflow, the incident management system is capable of like handling such large scale catastrophic failures. So that's pretty much it. And uh, these are some of the papers um, that uh, I think uh, are good and uh, goes into this topic of that we discussed this evening. Yeah, so, so capacity planning, um, ca capacity planning is not something that you do like when something bad has happened, right? Capacity planning has to be done from the, from the, from day one, right? So I think being very conservative is the key, right? Be, cons be as conservative as you want to be when it, when it comes to capacity planning. Everything that runs needs to be, needs to be put under like a micro, like a lens, right? Like, don't even consider like any process which is running on the machine to be like, to be like, you know, uh, to be whitelisted. Because failure, like, things can go south like from anywhere. So I think like, understand like, how things are running like at the node level from the very beginning, keep things monitored, and then like put reasonable constraints, right? At start, like start with higher constraints, right? Be conservative, and as you understand, the software more as you have more experience then like tune them farther down. Should we run uh, like a scheduler as a, like a container or as a kind of a process? So scheduler, I mean it depends like I mean it's a it depends answer, right? Like are we talking about the scheduler it depends on the scheduler control plane and uh, the scheduler agent. Uh, I've seen people do that as well. I I would never run schedulers on uh, on in a container. Uh, I would always treat schedulers to be like a system software that that is has the right amount of privileges and so on. Um, something needs to like at the end of the day, like the turtle needs to like end somewhere, right? Like scheduler is like the scheduler agent is at that level, right? I would not run that as in a container. What happens when that fails? What happens when Docker has a bug, right? Now, because Docker has a, the most reliable thing at the end of the day is your kernel, right? Is your distro, right? Everything else, like everything else is like stacked on top of it, right? If your scheduler also has the same dependency as your application, right? When your application fails and there is a bug in like your container software, like how is your, like your scheduler is going to fail at the same time. The, when incidents happen, what the best thing that I have seen happen when incident happen is have as little dependencies between incidents, right? Like if something fails and also something else fails, which you use to deploy the thing that has failed, like thing, like it doesn't really work well, right? Like in my opinion, and yeah, I mean, yeah, but sure, that works like if you have 100 servers. Now you have like say 50,000 servers or 10,000 servers. Like, yeah, at, at scale, like, I, I mean, sure, like at, if you have 10 servers, yeah, do that. Yeah. Okay. And oh. What kind of uh, scheduling strategy should follow, like, like the pack or uh, kind of round robin? Like, like, I see a good statement pack would be impacted first by the kind of distribution first. So, in that case, the security panel would change, like, right? so. So it so it depends. I mean, bin packing has been like the 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 primary technique for deploying software. But I think not. I think I know for sure that bin packing is not the only answer, yeah. right? For example, uh, like I am implementing right now in Nomad. Uh, I mean, it's already running in production. I need to upstream it. Like a new ranker, which basically like spreads applications across horizontally rather than bin pack. Uh, for example, some of the problems that you will see is. If you're running GPU uh, 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 software which is using GPU, if you do bin packing, what would happen is your data center, part of your data center, you're going to be creating a hotspot. 
So when you create hotspot in part of your data center, like then the thermal uh, effects will be like really bad and some hardware is going to be like deteriorating faster than like other hardware. So what you want in that case is like you want a very uh, uniform thermal um, uh, thermal uh, outcome right across the data center where things are getting uh, consuming the same amount of power throughout so that the cooling is more uniform right so then like in that case like you do, you can't do bin packing right but there are some cases in which bin packing is better like if you have like jobs which can finish which doesn't have a SLA and they can finish like whenever they need to finish right like just do bin packing in that case I think there is a case for both so how do you do capacity in case of putting about bin packing environment or a shipping or a bin of scale out yeah Yeah, so I have always done like node pools, right? I have always done node pools where like you have certain nodes where we do bin packing and certain nodes where we do like um, spread, um, uh, sp uh, the, we apply the spread algorithm or anti-affinity where like things are getting spread evenly. Can we choose half? Like yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you should. Like that, these are the things that, these are, this is where the conversation should be like when you choose a scheduler or write a new scheduler is that those kind of capabilities which impact right the data center performance not only just application performance has to be incorporated back up into the into the scheduler right absolutely I don't have a good answer for that um, the, the the I don't have a silver bullet answer for that right like in the past as a scheduler developer I would roll out um, I would roll like a new node um, so schedulers like usually with schedulers right like you um, you do rolling deploys right again like it depends uh, whether we are talking about the scheduler uh, the scheduler control plane or the scheduler agent the scheduler agent is easier yeah. right on the scheduler on the scheduler control plane like I have always deployed like a single node observe the metrics right and in a lot of cases I had simulators right I had basically like given the scheduler like a static view of the cluster and seen like how the scheduler is performing right in some cases I would run benchmarks and so on against the scheduler and see how the scheduler is performing if I have a ch if I have a change in the ranking algorithm so and so on there are no benchmarks but there are traces though right there are publicly available traces uh, like uh, I think the Quincy paper like points out to a publicly available trace uh, where like you can have like a trace of your cluster and uh, run your you, uh, run your scheduler against it. I mean, of course, like you have to now make sure your scheduler can consume the trace. So, so the trace which you have available has to be like basically doing against Kubernetes. Yeah. So I need to read those traces and kind of fire up. That's what I'm saying. Like, you, fire up the kind of pods or whatever according to the trace. I mean, yeah, the scheduler needs to do that, right? But you can't do that in production, right? Like in production, the only way to like test whether something is yeah, working or not is metrics. Yeah. So we, so we we had written one for Mesos, um, like for our scheduler on on top of Mesos. Um, we w I think someone started work on this uh, for Nomad as well. We can easily write like a simulator for Nomad as well because the scheduler is just a library. So I can like easily yeah exactly. So I can write a simulator pretty easily. I'm I don't contribute to Kubernetes. Um, I so I don't know what so Kubernetes does. Yeah. And if we have a common trace and that can be fed to all three of them. And so so those I think you can do easily. Like if you have three schedulers, like three different schedulers, like every scheduler uh, team has done a done a uh, benchmark. So in two, 2016, I think we did a benchmark in Nomad. We can run a billion containers, not a billion, a million containers under five minutes. Okay. And uh, on like we did it on 15,000 machines. And I think like on Kubernetes, the max you could do like 100 machines or 1000 machines. Yeah, okay. yeah, the scalability of Kubernetes is pretty low compared to like other schedulers. Um, but that's because they didn't prioritize that. Um, of, uh, or whereas like in Nomad, like we, you know, like we, from the get go, like we made sure performance was uh, like at the peak. Uh, I know people run like 100,000 containers like on a daily basis using Nomad. 
some uh, finance companies, um, investment banking com companies. Um, Mesos, I think they have similar benchmarks too. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Uh -huh. So, Ma Mesos Marathon? Again, like uh, a lot of people, like sure, like I think, like he was saying that you get the benefits of of deploying like the new scheduler, right? If you run it on top of a scheduler, I would not do that. Yeah, exactly. That's, so I'm having a hard time trying to convince the client not to do that. But for some reason, engineering team thinks that they need to own the scheduler, and only way for them to own the scheduler is if I do marathon on top of marathon and give a P U uh, a marathon for them to play, but still share the whole cluster. I mean, so I think in that case, right, like if you want to have like a fair discussion, right, like about based on just merits and demerits, you can talk about what happens when this marathon goes down, right? You can talk about how does marathon reconcile state, right? No, the, the argument is slightly different. So in a large organization, uh -huh. you have a business unit who's going to spend money to buy nodes. Uh -huh. They don't want to share this node uh -huh. with another BU uh -huh. who's not going to be spending money for sure. this purchase. Yeah. The idea is that you know you put a constraint to make this uh, marathon run only on or manage these three or four nodes from your budget. That's a that's a that's a shortcoming of marathon. Exactly. So what's what's the right way to deal with these kind of um, enterprise issues where somebody says these nodes belong to me? Previously, you would allocate just physical servers and say you know I give you access to your developers and you do whatever that you want. Yeah. But now. You Finance wants to come and say, no, you have to bring back, you keep coming and asking these servers every three months. And yeah, abs absolutely, yeah, yeah. Resource here or DCO yeah. is supposedly the solution. Yeah. But, so what, what approach would you suggest for us? I, I can tell you like what we did in the past, right? Um, and the, we did exactly the same thing, right? We had, we had quotas, we implemented quotas. So with quotas, we said that every namespace or every organization gets a fixed amount of quota, right? And within that quota, you have like also like your um, your priorities, right? So say for example, you are like a BU and you have like, your quota is like 50, you are paying for 50,000 nodes. So the scheduler understand that that quota is present and it will allocate only like 50,000 cores, right? If the scheduler cannot or doesn't have the idea or notion of quota, that's when like the problems that you are saying happens. So if it was up to me, I would not use a scheduler which doesn't understand quotas. So is, is Nomad from that perspective um, um, a better choice for a multi-business unit organization? We recently implemented namespaces. And with namespaces, we implemented quotas. Are you saying that Nomad does not support quota? I'm sure it does, right? So, so. So I'll. I'll let you answer that question as well, but to my knowledge, I, I've, I've done a lot of, I've done Mesos for a long time. Um, so Mesos has the concept of a quota um, and it has the concept of a role, right? So in the Mesos master, or you can basically say that this role, the framework which has registered for this role gets this many resources. So one option for you could be, I don't know, I have not kept up with like how Mesos has evolved over the years is run different frameworks, right? Like you can configure the framework name, for example, and create a role for that framework name and say that this framework with this role gets only this much quota. So then Mesos was built to be like multiple frameworks, right? Run each marathon thing as like its own, I don't know if it's possible, but run them as like a scheduler with roles defined. It just seems like, you know, um, something that is uh, you know, bolted onto it rather than something that you should natively be doing. So the whole what my looking at yeah. uh, their architecture seems to be that it's not meant for doing something like that. We just figured out this is one way of doing it, yeah. but not necessarily the best way. I mean, having highly availability and having 100,000 containers and all is fine, yeah. but then if you end up using somebody else's Absolutely. Um, servers, yeah. um, it's no Check out the concept of like roles in Mesos, um, in Mesos master, not in, and you should be able to, f I think, configure Marathon to do that. 
Marathon has a lot of other problems. I don't want to go there, so but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I have no comments there. <laughs> so on the way, you say you're in this uh, cluster orchestration uh, platform and you never implemented scaling, you just, you just ran something wherever you wanted. Right. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? By, by the way, did I answer like your previous question or like yeah, do we that's need? A, that's a longer debate. Sure. But, uh, Right. You know, the more complex the, the application, more dependencies, yeah. you're going to pay the in uh, other than compute resources. So some of the cheaper resources, the sure. harder resources is recovering from sure. these uh, failures sure. and so on. Um, I was wondering if there is any methodology that is emerging which uh, reflects in your capacity planning as the scheduler or as the data center operator. Um, I mean, if you're talking about like how much time it takes to like recover from failure, right? Like at the cluster scheduler level, the way we have done it in the past is um, always by using chaos, right? So, like you know, you use things like Chaos Monkey and other tools and like shoot the scheduler, right? And see like how long it takes to takes it for you to like even bring a scheduler up, right? Or even like understand like what is the queue length of like the number of jobs that has been submitted but hasn't been scheduled yet, right? These are metrics like has that has to be um, that has to be like observed very closely if you are a scheduler developer or a scheduler operator. Um, in Nomad, like we basically even let people uh, put decide like how many batch schedulers they want to run and how many uh, service schedulers they want to run. Uh, because like it's event driven, like say for example, if you have two batch schedulers running and if you have someone doing a lot of batch jobs, obviously like your batch scheduler is going to be like be lagging behind. We even like expose things like timer, like we, dis we tell you like if you have this many number of nodes, like how many, how much time did like the scheduler spend to make one allocation, right? So obviously like the, the scheduler software itself like needs to be monitored and seen like all those things like understand like how the scheduler is performing and then provision resources to the schedulers accordingly, right? Observability is again the key. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I am pretty sure like there are me, uh, like more methodolic, methodological approaches for doing this, but I have always used metrics and used observability to figure out like the amount of resources that has to be um, provisioned. Um, more of a practical question. Yeah. Yeah. And most of them, at least in the case of um, COS and ESOs, it seems that the vendor, the, the scheduler vendor, they are the ones providing the framework for running HDFS mm -hmm. or Kafka yeah. and so on. The open source software vendors themselves don't seem to be providing any of these, um, um, what I would call as a, a helm or a, a, a universe package or whatever. Yeah. So from that perspective, which scheduler is popular amongst um, project owners themselves that they would like to support? I just don't see anybody out there doing. I it. mean, this is a very political question. I, 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 I yeah. As an operator, it's I don't a, want to get stuck with the scheduler that nobody else. Absolutely, is absolutely. Is going to be Hashicorp or is going to be yeah, yeah. Sphere or anybody. In absolutely. Fact, that's another big challenge with an enterprise. Like, why should I choose A versus yeah, B? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's a very political, the answer to that is like, it involves a lot of politics behind the scenes, a lot of handshakes between corporations and people, right? So there is no like logical reason why you, like vendor, uh, <laughs> vendors use this like. The stupidest thing I can say is, um, this year was, for example, ships um, uh, Mongo without authentication. Sure, and then. If you use their framework. Yeah, and then Tangent probably does like, yeah. <laughs> and they say, okay, if you want something, you click here. And they give you a referral kind of a thing to say data stacks for Cassandra and so on. So it's, it seems ridiculous. I, I can talk about it, but in 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 uh, let's do talk about it offline. It's a it's a, it's more than just like merits and but demerits. Just, uh, TLDR, which one do you think is most likely to be 
favored by open source projects because of the of the of the of various <laughs> dynamics that are going on right now kubernetes because of the the dynamics of everything that is happening around even though i don't contribute so like i mean i'm very impartial to this uh, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There is a paper. I I didn't. I ran out of time uh, to add this. Uh, search for Hercules or something, or so I I can't pronounce like Hercules. Like it's a Google paper. So if you go to like re Google's research publications and see like the the distributed systems column, like you'll see like a paper where they use deep learning to figure out uh, which workload to run along with which, and they are s saving a lot of power. They are improving on performance and so on. Uh, absolutely, this is the future. No one in open source is doing it yet, uh, but uh, you know, like it's it's obviously going to come like in open source sometime soon. The the reason I think why no one has done it yet is because the reason, like for example, like Kubernetes is so popular because people don't need that much scale, right? If people needed that much scale, like people would be talking about this stuff that I just talked about for the last half an hour. People don't talk about all this stuff. People are like, okay, what is my friend using or what is someone X using? Not for bad reasons, but because they don't need a lot of these things, right? Like you would start needing this like if power is your constraint, right? If you are not constrained by power, right? If you are not constrained by the number of machines you can add because the government won't give you as much power, why do you care so much about improving performance, right? And by improving performance, you are decreasing power consumption, right? So if you're constrained by power, if you're constrained, constrained by all other resources, I think that's when like you do deep learning and so on, and only like very few companies are like doing this stuff. Yeah, I was reading about TPUs uh, that, that Google yeah. trusted. Yeah. So they have designed special GPU-like TPUs yeah. where they do approximate calculations. Sure, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're doing ASICs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like people are using deep learning like across the board now to reduce, improve performance. But not at like 10 node scale. Like there is no use at that scale. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I think you just, I think this is the thing, right? Like there is, there is, I mean, I think this is the thing, right? Like. Like all these sidecars and all this stuff, right? Like these are these are these are failures that are waiting to happen, right? You need them, sure, but like at what scale do you need them, and why do you need them, right? Like for me, I think, if, like if if your notion is to keep the business running, like you want to sleep well at night, like keep your dependencies to the minimum, right? Make sure like you know like how this recovers, right? Instead of like ten different running ten different things which fail in ten different ways, right? You're just Increasing the permutations of the number of ways you are going to fail. Example of disaster waiting to happen is people are running DCOS cluster for uh -huh. 30 nodes with a single NFS backend. <laughs> and everything is mounted on the NFS. So they are like, oh, my NFS will never fail. And it happened. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the point is for most people, they seem to think that, you know, using a scheduler suddenly solves infrastructural problems. Unless the underlying infrastructure itself is highly available, so it doesn't matter what you do, you still tend to treat um, the entire system as a highly available system. I mean, I, I, I would like make a small correction there, right? Uh, the underlying infrastructure is never going to be highly available, right? Like the cluster scheduler has to understand that the topology or the, or the failures that are happening. Most people don't know that, like whether all of them are in the same rack. Right. It's, uh, sharing the same PDU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know that. Yeah, yeah. See, the guys who are operating the cluster are very different from the side ops. They don't know that. But that they not. They seem to think 
that oh everything is magically working at the back end. But see that knowledge, right? That knowledge that the data center people have needs to be exposed as a failure domain, and as labels. The worst ones when it comes to uh, the hardware that they use need not necessarily or their understanding of how infrastructure needs to be managed uh -huh. to run something like Mesos or Kubernetes. They're not very much, they're the rack and stack guys. Right? Sure. Right? So it's at least here in India, I don't know how it's in the West where it's, uh, you know, probably co-location is much smarter, but here it's, when, when shit hits the fan, you figure out, oh damn, we're sharing the same yeah. um, switch or so on and so forth. So we are a long way off. Yep. Yeah, and I think this is where like educating people about this first principles are important. Cool. Thanks, everyone.